In life, there are hard questions like Pepsi or Coke, iPhone or Android, Mac or PC. But when it comes to music and podcasts, it seems the answer is clear. Spotify is king. But what is the reality behind the success? Welcome back to our channel, guys. Today, we'll learn the answer to this question, did Spotify start illegally? Stay tuned and let's get into it right now. Part 1. The Birth of Spotify Spotify was launched in 2008 by two Swedish entrepreneurs, Daniel Ek and Martin Lawrenson, and since then, it's been changing the music industry and the streaming services forever. Services before Spotify, like LimeWire, allowed listeners to download all music illegally, leaving the producers and artists with nothing. But since its launch, Spotify has become worth almost 7 billion euros. It allows you to follow and like artists to be notified when they release a new song or have concerts. So needless to say, Spotify works for the artist too. Rasmus Fleischer is a researcher and historian from Sweden who has a particular interest in copyright issues. His early fascination with intellectual property led him to join Sweden's Pirate Byron or Piracy Bureau, an advocacy group focused on the free sharing of information. Along with other members of the group, he went on to help launch the popular torrenting site, The Pirate Bay. So when Spotify was in its nascent days, Fleischer and his colleagues took a keen interest in the service. Fleischer then moved on from The Pirate Bay and collaborated with several other authors on a book called Spotify Teardown inside the black box of streaming music that was published back in 2019. Spotify's early use of pirated music is certainly the juiciest anecdote and his story of how he was initially tipped off to that practice is pretty funny. The Spotify beta launched overseas back in 2008, and around that time, Fleischer was in a band and they decided to distribute their album exclusively through the Pirate Bay. Soon after releasing the torrent to his own album, Fleischer discovered that it was available for streaming on Spotify. He said, I thought that was funny, so I emailed Spotify and asked how they obtained it. They said that now, during the test period, we will use music that we find. For Fleischer, this story is an enlightening example of how important pirate culture was to the birth of Spotify. Before we move any further, if you're enjoying this video, then do give it a big thumbs up and subscribe to our channel if you haven't done so yet. Also, do remember to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with all of our latest content. Part 2 Spotify vs The Artists Let's take Pandora. It was a free music streaming service that relied heavily on ads. Spotify, on the other hand, offered a paid membership which eliminated all ads. Behind plenty of features and a smooth, engaging platform was X obsession with excellence. He wanted the best listening experience to convince users to pay the monthly $10. After all, that's how he had gotten over 1 million paying subscribers by March of 2011. He aimed to replicate that success in the United States. While ad-free music is best music, Spotify also offered more mobile tools like playlists and storing songs, which Pandora didn't. The United States, the US loved it. The brand also became a staple in American culture. Barack Obama launched his playlist before the 2012 elections, but democratizing music, as Ek once said, wasn't a smooth ride, especially for artists. You see, Spotify pays the owner of the rights $0.006 to $0.0084 per play. The owner then splits up the money between the label, artists, producers, etc. Artists didn't like that. In 2011, Adele and Spotify couldn't agree on the release of her album 21, so the singer chose Rhapsody instead, exclusively for paying subscribers. Other big names like Tool and Tom York have criticized Spotify for weakening the already bleak opportunities artists have. Just to earn approximately minimum wage, an artist would need 400,000 streams per month. But perhaps the biggest feud was with Taylor Swift. In 2014, she didn't release her album 1989 on Spotify, then removed her entire catalog from Spotify, the main issue being Spotify's free tier. Instead, she released 1989 on Jay-Z's title, A Paid Service. Then, in 2015, Apple Music announced three-month free trials with artists receiving no royalties from those free trials and she was ticked. Apple listened and dished out royalties, but Spotify was becoming a big name. 
it had gone from 10 million paying users in 2014 to 50 million in 2017. That's hard to ignore. Even Adele released her album 25 on Spotify. Part 3. The Future of Spotify Spotify isn't home free, especially when it comes to money. The famous free-to-paid user churn is still a challenge. They did see profit in 2019, but projections indicated it wouldn't last and it didn't. In 2020, so many advertisers withdrew that it failed to meet revenue expectations and this was a company that didn't rely entirely on ads. Their average revenue per user also declined 9% year to year. Then, there's the technological side to it as well. Yep, Spotify is at the forefront of AI and user experience, but competition is getting stiffer. All those big names are trying to catch up. But Spotify has an ace up its sleeve. Yes, they've dominated music, and now they're going after the video market. Both free and paid users will now be able to watch videos from select podcast creators contrary to YouTube in which only paid subscribers can enjoy such content. It's easy to forget that a lot of tech titans got their start in illegal piracy. Uber CEO Travis Kalanick's first venture was a failed peer-to-peer -peer network called Scour. Before making billions with Facebook, Sean Parker was a founder of Napster, and Spotify CEO Daniel Ek was the CEO of uTorrent before going off to found his own company. It was a kinder, gentler time of tech mavens breaking laws. These days, people like Kalonic have to do some real damage to disrupt.